if you still have a garden left and it's not all weeds, you're doing good. I never cease to be amazed how healthy all my weeds grow. But I'll tell you, I think having a failed garden is a good thing if for one reason only it teaches you a little bit more about the parables of Jesus Christ because man those weeds grow and Jesus didn't use any of that stuff that you use Rich what's it called herbicide. a herbicide I thought it was called something else you know today there's an endless amount of information what to use in your garden and what to what route to go to grow stuff and sometimes I get caught up reading these articles and I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm you know you come across these people that like they start out on a good track you know how the internet is and all of a sudden they go into a rant they go into a rant and it goes on and on and on and then they lose you but I found this one article really funny the guy goes on and on and on. And you know how you've been online, you, the responses below? You've seen that? The first response was from a guy, and he just wrote a few lines. He said to the guy, he said, Be the person your dog thinks you are. That says a lot, and it says more if you have a dog. But we need to be the person Jesus believes we could be and knows we could be. Let's pray. Father, you said in the beginning, let there be light. I pray for that light here this morning. I pray that you would cleanse and open our hearts, that there be nothing between. That once we see your light, Father, you give us the strength to walk therein by simply placing our hands in yours. I ask this in your name. Amen. You know, if you look closely at a person's hands, you can you could tell a lot about them. Obviously, you can tell if they're clean. That's the first thing. And after the introductions this morning, it's too late. You can also tell kind of what they do maybe for an occupation, whether they have a sedentary job or whether they have a physical job. You might not be able to tell if they're married in this church. Maybe you can. But there's a lot of things you can observe about a person's hands. however it may be so. But one thing's for certain. If your life was in jeopardy and you were going to fall, say, off a high area, you wouldn't want the person's hands reaching for you to be weak. You'd want a strong set of hands, something that could grasp, something rough that you could hang on to something that won't let you go. You want the hands of Jesus Christ. And Jesus still has those hands, scars and all. As we know from the Bible, Jesus came to this world for a specific, at a specific time. He was given a specific message. He was given a specific mother and father and also learned a specific occupation. God had a reason for every detail in the life of Jesus Christ. Nothing was left to chance. He grew up in the rough side of town. He was taught a rough trade. In fact, by today's standards, his lack of educational opportunity, as they say today, would have disqualified him in many people's eyes from being the pastor, 
being the rabbi, being the priest, just to name a few things. But the Lord in his providence chose the best method for teaching his son. My point is simply this. Jesus had a hard life. In the Bible, he's called the carpenter's son in Mark 3, Mark 6, 3. He was known as the carpenter's son in Matthew 13, 55. If you study this out a little bit, there's some evidence that the, the word used for carpenter can be translated more broadly into artisan or contractor or handyman even possibly. It is possible, therefore, and probably likely that Jesus was just the sort of guy you'd call if you need something fixed, no matter whether it was wood or stone or whatever. By the time Jesus was old enough to work, probably around 12 years old or more, he worked with his father. He spent most of his time probably with his father. By the time Jesus was old enough and, and are ready to start his occupation, he probably have, has encountered every stubborn stone that couldn't be chiseled to fit in a wall. He's probably encountered every odious knot that couldn't be smoothed out. All these things Jesus encountered, worked at, by the time he was old enough to start his ministry, probably a lot of blood and sweat and tears, in a sense, went into his work. Why did God pick that occupation for Jesus? There were no power tools back then. It wasn't easy like I have it. Everything was done by hand and by your own strength. I think, myself, and this is only my guess, but I think the Lord chose that occupation because he was trying to teach Jesus, in a sense, to work with the most stubborn thing that there is, and that's a person's heart. Because a person does not want to surrender their heart to him, it's a long, hard pull. And Jesus knew all about that. It reminds me of a story of the famous Captain or Admiral Nelson when he took a French ship. The French officer came to Nelson and said, I surrender, and op offered him his hand. Nelson replied, First, give me your sword. Our hands sometimes are too full for what Jesus has to offer and we're not let, ready to let it go and to surrender, to put our hands in Christ. Please turn to Matthew. Most of my text today will be in the book of Matthew. Matthew 14. Matthew 14, 29. Type it in your iPad, type it in your iPhone, type it in your tablet. Turn it in your Bible. Matthew 14, 29. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid because he began to sink and he cried Lord save me and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him O thou little faith why didst thou doubt everybody knows pretty much knows the backdrop to the story there's a storm he sees Jesus asks if he could come out and Christ calls him out when Peter obeyed Christ, obeyed Christ's call. 
It was noisy and stormy. Jesus probably beckoned him with his hands as well. I've heard this story many times through church, through the years of going to church, and usually the spin is, I say spin, but to me it was anyway, that Peter was ridiculed and he was put down because what does Jesus say? You know, oh, you have a little, why did you doubt, you know? I never thought that was good. I don't tell this story to criticize Peter. I give Peter credit. He got out of the boat. Would you or I? The Bible says immediately Jesus put forth his hand and caught him immediately. And that ad then adds the most familiar critique. Why did you doubt? O oh, ye of little faith. Jesus can critique Peter, but I have no right. Unless I'm willing to step out in faith, a faith I never knew, I shouldn't utter a word. Most of us won't venture out when Jesus calls. There's a lot of rough waves between me and Jesus. Because I won't put my hand in Jesus' hand. Because there's a chance if I do that, I might lose something. Because it means getting out of a safe boat possibly in sinking waves. We don't know when Jesus pulled Peter out. He might have been up to his nose. He might have grabbed him by the hair. But he grabbed him and saved him nonetheless. So when I'm offered the Savior's hand, I refuse thinking, well, I know what's best. Since God gave his all, he expects the same thing in a return. Jesus didn't die so I could get more stuff, whether I need it or not. Stepping out, taking Jesus by the hand means letting go, sometimes, of what I already have in them. Put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ. Put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let everything he lived for be put in your hands, your minds, your heart, your soul. And he can and he will do it. How far away was Jesus when Peter sank. How far away? The Bible says immediately he put forth his hand and saved him. I don't believe you can follow God and it not cost something. But if you follow the world, it'll cost you everything. It cost Judas everything. He was sick of the government of his day, like most of us are today. His mind was caught up in everything of that nature. He couldn't let go. He couldn't let go of what it had to offer. His hands were filled with 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 27, 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he had, was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Verse 4. Matthew 27, verse 4. Saying, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? 
you see thou to it. Is there any one of us today in the past and the present that couldn't have said these very words? I have betrayed innocent blood. Romans says we all come short and fall, fail to the of the glory of God. Judas didn't call out to Jesus like Peter did. He uses his own hands to end his life. The hands of Christ are always outstretched to us, and they're outstretched this morning. Matthew 27, since you're in that chapter, verse 24. Another man that had his hands so full of the world, so full of politics and position and greed and avarice that he didn't have time for Jesus Christ. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail, he's your typical politician, right? There's the compromise. But rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this person. We're all guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. Pilate washed his hands to declare his innocency while rejecting Christ. His hands were full of everything else. Most traditions about Pilate say that he lost everything in the long run anyway. So he gained nothing. Years ago, a, a righteous man asked a man that was known to be a, a criminal. Looking on him, he noticed his dress was of the worst sort and his his whole condition was in bad shape. And he says, it doesn't look like your wickedness has prospered you anything. And the man replied, if I had spent half the time and energy, I've spent doing wicked things, doing wrong things. I might have been a wealthy person. I'm homeless now. I've twice been in state prison. And I've made my acquaintance of all sorts of evils. But he said, to tell you the truth, the worst punishment there is for me is being what I am. Christ says his burden is light, and we know his hands are strong. They were tempered and tested. They have never failed. Place your hands in the hands of Jesus Christ is my challenge this morning. We're going to move out away from the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. I just have a few short stories here. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Jesus comes to his hometown. He's there to do some good. And this is the response. This is the response from the people who think they know him best. Is not this the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, we all know the line, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. And lastly, it says, and he could, couldn't do no mighty works save to lay his hands on a few sick folks and heal them 
Jesus came there to heal. Think about this. One touch from Jesus Christ and you could see. One touch from Jesus Christ and you could hear. One touch from Jesus Christ and you could speak. One touch from Jesus Christ and you could be made whole. And they refused. They refused because they thought they knew him. Because they thought, well, he didn't go to the rabbinical college or school. Why would they want this dirty carpenter to touch them? So they were offended. The truly unsurrendered heart that has just enough religion that he's comfortable is never satisfied, is always finding fault. And he refuses the hand of God when it's offered to them. I mentioned just a few people, and as you know, I don't try to go too long with any sermon I speak, but I mentioned just a few people just to illustrate the lack of surrender in some and the half surrender in others. At times, probably one of us or all of us have fit one of these people or were one of these people. Jesus is beckoning today in our lives to trust him with their, to, to trust them, trust him with your life. He's trying, he's calling those who haven't accepted him, come. Come as you are. And for those who have ever already accepted Christ, he's saying, step out of the boat. His hands are strong. Don't resist his call. Its cost can't be estimated. It can't be counted. No one can really understand what it cost Christ. Most people here have heard of the movie Schindler's List. Most people have, a lot of people have seen that movie. It won a lot of awards years ago. And for those few that may have not know what it's about, it's about uh, Oscar Schindler who, who saved about a thousand Jews, I guess, during the Holocaust. It's a sad movie, but it's also a, a good movie. Most people know this man's name because of the movie. But what if I mentioned a man called Frank Foley? Most of us wouldn't even know who that is. In fact, I didn't until I started doing some research. It is estimated that Foley saved upward of 10,000 Jews during the Holocaust from certain death. He was a spy that worked as a passport officer. He forged passes, tweaked visas so Jews could get anywhere that Hitler's rule wasn't there, that Hitler didn't have any rule. He even entered concentration camps to issue visas and travel documents to save people. There's some statues of him today in some parts of Europe, I believe. And I believe he's now mentioned in the Holocaust Museum, but many years after his death. Jesus is right here among us. He has yours and my passport in his hands. He has stamped it with the blood with his very hands. Eternal life for those who will accept. Will you accept him today?
It sometimes means stepping out into the waves. But Jesus is always near. You can put down your Bibles now. Please pick up your hymnal. I'm not going to sing right now. Lucky you. Turn to page 309. Shirley? Shirley? Sorry. I just want to read some of the verses in the song before we sing it. Sorry. The first verse reads, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I don't know about you guys, but so often when I've sang this song, I've muttered those words because I know I wasn't living them. When Christ asked me to, maybe it's been the same with some of you at some times. Sometimes you sing the words unconsciously, not really taking in what the words are and what they mean. The man who wrote this hymn was struggling. That's why the hymn was written. He was struggling between a job and a secular pursuit. He was, he was a very accomplished musician. And he was struggling because he was also an evangelist. He was an evangelist part-time, and he was torn between the two fields, pursuing his career or following what he thought the Lord was asking him to do. In 1896, while conducting music for a church event, he finally surrendered his desires completely to God. He made the decision to become a full-time evangelist. He submitted completely to the will of God. And this great song was born out of that. I surrender all. I surrender all. Do we surrender all? You know, when you surrender something, it means taking it out of your hands and putting it in Christ's hands. Jesus had a public ministry. Most of what he did was in front of the whole world. You remember in Matthew 14 when the woman touched his garment into the crowd and he stopped everybody, the whole crowd, and he said, Who touched me? Why? Because he wanted her to confess in front of all those unbelieving people there and believing people there what had just taken place. This ministry, this church, bringing the word of God to people is about stepping out, stepping forward, not hiding in a pew. My request for those this morning is if there's anybody here that hasn't accepted Jesus Christ to come forward and acknowledge it to the world that Jesus is your Savior from this day forth. You know, the Savior lived, taught, suffered, and was crucified, stripped naked, 
to bring us salvation. He demands that we seek Him openly. His religion is nothing to be ashamed of. Jesus Himself says, If you are ashamed of Him, He will be ashamed of you. And if you do not confess Him, He will not confess you. Trust in the hands of Jesus Christ. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Can I say that? Can I say worldly pleasures all forsaken? I guess I can't say it. If I knew in 20 minutes I was going to die. If you knew in 20 minutes you were going to die, it wouldn't be that hard, would it? Why? Why? Why wait? If you need to step out of the boat to come a little closer to Jesus Christ, I ask you to come forward as well. Come forward to the altar. Come forward here and we could pray together. And this I ask for those who haven't accepted Christ, come forward. For those who want to Step out of the boat and take a deeper walk with Christ. Put your hand in the hand of Jesus. As we sing this song, please come forward. This I ask in Jesus' name. Rich, would you lead us out, please?
Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that you surrendered all, that we can surrender all. Amen. Father, for those who haven't accepted you, I pray that they would and give everything and all to you. And for us, Lord, that some that have, that haven't fully got on out of the boat, Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd put your hand in ours. Please, Jesus, put your hand in ours. We need you so much, Lord. We need to surrender, Lord. We need to mean what we say. We need, Father, your spirit in our lives to be able to do it, Father. I beg in, in the name of Jesus that all that have acknowledged and came forward, that you would bless them, Father, that you'd give them the strength to step out and live, Father, the life that you want us to live, that we might be a witness in this world of coldness. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.